In this presentation, you will learn about the test order authority provided by Section 4A2 of the Toxic Substances Control Act, which is commonly referred to as TSCA. This presentation will focus on information a recipient of such an order will need to know in accordance with the agenda found on the following slide. We will first discuss the test order authority under TSCA and the issuance of such orders. Next, we will provide an overview of the issuance of orders and then walk through the different options available in responding to an order. Then we will discuss the role of building consortia. Finally, we will discuss the fee associated with orders. TSCA Section 4 Order Background under TSCA Section 4, EPA has the authority to require the generation of new information by chemical manufacturers, including importers and chemical processors. The 2016 Lautenberg Chemical Safety Act amendments to TSCA expanded EPA's testing authority by including orders. The purpose of such orders is to collect data specifically in support of chemical risk evaluation. How do Section 4 orders fit into the TSCA framework and EPA's mission? Under TSCA Section 6b, EPA is required to adhere to timelines and conduct risk evaluations to determine whether or not chemical substances present an unreasonable risk to human health or the environment. TSCA Section 4a2 gives EPA the authority to issue orders when EPA finds that the generation of new information is necessary to perform a risk evaluation under TSCA Section 6b or to prioritize the chemicals for risk evaluation under Section 6b. How EPA identifies the manufacturers and processors subject to orders. There is no required method for EPA to use when identifying manufacturers or processors for a given chemical. For manufacturers, as an example, EPA can identify manufacturers of a chemical by using the final list of manufacturers for the Fees for Administration of Toxic Substances Control Act rule. For processors, as an example, EPA can identify processors of a chemical by using Toxics Release Inventory TRI reporting forms, which indicate processing activities for chemicals reported to TRI. For example, an order issued prior to July 1, 2021, the deadline for 2020 TRI data, would use 2019 TRI data, it being the most recent set of available TRI data. Note that companies who indicated process impurity as their sole processing activity to TRI would not be subject to orders. Required testing. Section 4 orders will require manufacturers and processors of the subject chemicals to develop or submit information. Examples of such information could include environmental fate, environmental hazard, occupational exposure, and consumer exposure data. Order and process timeline. Responding to the order. Within 45 calendar days of the effective date of an order, the recipient is required to inform the EPA via EPA CDX portal of which compliance option the recipient has chosen. The options are, option one, develop the information, Option two, submit existing information. Option three, request an exemption and provide rationale. Option four, claim that your company is not subject to the order. Option five, cease the manufacturer or processing of the chemical. Option one, develop the information. The order recipient must submit an initial response to develop the information, and indicate whether they have joined a consortium for a specific test or tests. The first required step in the process of developing the required information will be to submit an initial study plan for each test. EPA requires a recipient to submit an initial study plan for each test for 
for EPA's review. The study plan will detail how the recipient will execute the required test or tests in accordance with the standardized testing guidelines provided by EPA in the order. Following EPA's feedback on the submitted study plan, the recipient must submit a final study plan that addresses EPA's feedback for each test subject to the order. Deadlines for submitting the initial and final study reports to EPA for each required test will vary depending on the test protocol and will be stated in the orders. For option two, to submit existing information, you must submit an initial response and indicate whether the submittal will be part of a consortium, submit an existing study and or other relevant information that you believe EPA has not considered. Submit a supporting rationale as to why the data being submitted should be used in place of de novo testing. For example, if a recipient is submitting existing information on an analogous chemical in lieu of the subject chemical, the recipient must provide a robust rationale that explains how the submitted data is sufficiently similar and appropriate for use in risk evaluation in lieu of the ordered tests on the subject chemical. In submitting existing information, EPA encourages the use of standardized formats, such as the OECD harmonized templates. Additionally, note that in addition to such templates, EPA requires that full study reports also be submitted. EPA will review the submission of existing information based on the weight of the scientific evidence using all relevant information reasonably available to the agency. If submitted information is deemed acceptable, EPA will repeal all obligations of the order that the submitted study and or relevant information fulfills. If EPA determines that the submitted information is not acceptable, another response option must be selected. The agency will notify the recipient of this decision via CDX. Following such a decision, recipients must select another response option within 10 calendar days of being notified by EPA. All remaining deadlines specified in this order will be extended by the number of days between submission of the existing information and EPA's rejection of the information. Option 3. Request an exemption and provide rationale. The recipient must apply for an exemption from a requirement. An application for an exemption must provide information and a rationale to support a conclusion that the submitted data is equivalent or that equivalent data is being developed in accordance with a prior or currently active rule, order, or consent agreement. The recipient must demonstrate that submission of the information required by the order would be duplicative of such information. Additionally, the recipient must include the sworn statement. I understand that if this application is granted, I must pay fair and equitable reimbursement to the person or persons who incurred or shared in the costs of complying with the requirement to submit information and upon whose information the granting of my application was based. As an example, a recipient could apply for an exemption if they are aware that the, another party is subject to the same order and will be submitting the required data, but the exemption requesting recipient has not joined a consortium with this other company. EPA may terminate the exemption if it determines that none of the companies identified in the exemption application have complied with the information that was to be developed. Option 4. Claim that you are not subject to the order. Claim that you are not subject to the order by indicating that you do not manufacture or process the chemical identified by the order, or you believe that the order was otherwise sent to you in error. Explain the basis for the claim and include appropriate supporting information to substantiate the claim. If your claim is approved, EPA will notify you of its determination, i.e. whether or not you are not subject to the order. Option 5. Cease manufacture or processing of the chemical. You must inform EPA of your company's intent 
to cease the manufacture and or processing of the chemicals, for which you are required by this order to submit information by informing EPA that you intend to cease manufacture, including import or processing, within 90 days of the effective date of the order. And you must submit a letter which includes the required certifying statement. In responding to option five, failure to cease manufacture or processing of the subject chemical within 90 days of the effective date of the order would constitute a violation of the order and of TSCA section 151 and could result in liability under 18 U.S.C. section 1001. EPA encourages consortia building. Why? Avoidance of unnecessary duplication of tests. Opportunity for facility-specific data to be used efficiently. For example, a single data set may be amenable to read across to multiple facilities provided that similarity can be demonstrated. Examples of such similarities that could be demonstrated and the submission include, as appropriate, facility process descriptions, engineering controls, room volume, air exchange rates, work practices, PPE use, etc. Consolidation of testing costs minimize competition for laboratory services, and more efficient correspondence with EPA. Inform EPA of your selection to join a consortium. Order recipients that join testing consortia must each individually inform EPA via CDX for each specific chemical and for each specific test. The designated lead for the consortium must also submit to EPA via CDX a consortium initial response and study plans and financial study reports in accordance with the requirements of the order. All members of the consortium are liable in the event of any failure of the consortium to comply with the order. TSCA fees for orders. Manufacturers subject to a TSCA Section 4 order are also required to pay a fee, in addition to the testing requirements provided in an order as provided under 40 CFR Section 700.45. For each order, a $9,800 fee is split amongst all manufacturers subject to each order. The deadline for fee payments is within 120 days of issuance of an order. The invoice for the order will provide this deadline. Fees can be paid by responding to the invoice that will be sent by EPA via CDX. Take note that companies may form consortia to pay this fee. This fee consortia may be distinct from consortia used for fulfilling the other requirements of the order. Further information can be found on the EPA webpage titled TSCA Fees for Test Orders. This concludes the overview of TSCA test order basics. This last slide provides links to resources that you may wish to consult for additional background on test orders, risk evaluations, and TSCA generally.